Good afternoon, everybody. This is Mitch Robertson again um, with more on my work from home series. Um, this is kind of mirroring Extra Hop's work from home series. And just on my experiences with some of the challenges with working from home, I wanted to really start working through this and talking to people and, and actually giving some of my team um, some of the skills to help troubleshoot uh, challenges with people working from home because they, they, uh, all of these users are now um, working from home and uh, it's, it's a much larger number and it's challenging for these workers because uh, they're, they're working from home from the surf for the first time for many of them and, and they're afraid. They're, they're scared of uh, what's happening with their company. They're scared of what's happening with their job. Um, times are a little challenging. So because of that, um, it's important for me to realize the reason that I have um, the job that I have. And, and the number one thing I'm here to do is support the end users because the end users is what makes the, the company and the organizations that I work for their money. And um, without them doing that, there is no need for IT. So um, it's important to, to really put this in context and, and realize that it's important for me to try to make sure our end users have the best experience possible under the current circumstances and just to know that we're there to support them. So um, as those people work from home, some interesting things have started to happen. And so I kind of wanted to start talking about some of those. So um, what are some of the challenges that remote workers might have? Today, applications are slow to respond once they moved uh, away from the office. They aren't used to that. Applications slow uh, hangs, uh, poor voice quality, um, poor uh, video quality. Some of them just can't work because the, the experience is it's so bad and some of them will, will complain that it, they just can't work. They get disconnected. Um, they can't stay connected. Um, they can't even connect in some places. Um, so when they go home and they suddenly are, you know, when they're, they were used to working in the office and all of a sudden they were told to go home um, and start working, it's totally different. And, and many people have to remember that it's a completely different environment because in the office, everything's a controlled um, situation. In the most cases, your IT departments uh, have spent a lot of time and money to, to make things consistent, make things the same. And so they have the same networking infrastructure from building to building and, and office to office. And and they've, they've tried to make sure that everything is high performance as possible. And the, the machines are all built exactly the same. So they're imaged and those kind of things. And so some of the smaller places may not have that, but um, that's, that's something that most IT uh, places strive to get to. So um, when these people start working remotely, immediately as they're working remotely and they start to have all of these, th these problems, they start to worry, right? When this happens, worry starts to come into play. And with that worry, um, they start to uh, second guess their uh, contribution to the company, right? Um, so you can see this becomes a problem. Um, and so what do they do is they call support, right? They, they want support. They want to get um, better at what they're doing and they, they want to contribute to the company because everybody's seeing all these people that are being laid off and they're going, hey, I need to be sure I'm doing everything I can for my company. And the majority of people, that's what they're wanting to do. So it's it's important to realize that these challenges are real and they're, they're, they add additional stress to our employees. And so um, me as one of the IT members, I, I think about that and I think, how can I relieve that stress? How can I make things better for them? So, um, some things to remember though about all this is that our, the providers are just getting slammed. Um, it, it's funny, the, I, I was listening to somebody talk the other day and the, they were they were telling me that, man, the, the end users just, their, their providers, a lot of them are just horrible, right? And so um, what's happening is the IT staff are blaming the providers for these poor connections. And my concern is, is what happens when 
um, the provider tells them there's nothing wrong with their connection. And if they do it enough times and call in enough times before long, who do they begin to not trust, right? Um, you've got this great big company. Um, I'm going to pick on Cox today, but they, they, they're huge, right? And so your, your providers are looking and going, well, our IT department is only 10 people. And they've got thousands, and they're telling me that there's there, there's no problem with their system. So um, it begins to to um, chip away at the confidence in uh, you know a company's IT organization when they continually blame the the problems on the provider and um, and or on a person's home network, right? Because if I'm on a home network and, and everything works great, all my streaming works great, all my other stuff works great, but I can't seem to do any work on it, then where's that problem come into play and and who do we trust? Well, it, it diminishes the, the employee's trust in their IT staff. And I see it all the time and I actually hear it. Um, I hear people complain about it and um, hear people make jokes about the internal IT staff, and it's kind of funny. When I worked for Microsoft, um, the few times that I had to call Microsoft's internal IT support was phenomenal. Those guys helped me troubleshoot my internal network. They really knew what they were doing, and they were just fantastic at it, right? And so um, it, it really gave me an insight into to totally different um methodology and, and and the way people explain things was much better than ever before so uh, it, it makes me really question um how we're how well we're troubleshooting some of our users network problems and i'm, I'm sure the support desks are are they're inundated so they need to get people off that phone as quick as they can and some of them it's just better to say it is the the provider or their in, their internal internet connection. But think of the impact that causes us on those end users. And remember those end users, uh, that's the reason we have our job. So providers being blamed for this stuff, be careful. Think about it long and hard. Have you really tested everything? Can you prove out that problem that it was them? In most cases, most of the users have limited knowledge of their networks. Um, and, and how their internal network works, let alone how they connect to, um, you know, their provider. And it was really funny the other day I was working with an end user and, and she keep, kept telling me, well, I'm using IPv4 network. Okay, that's great. Cool to know. Um, and, and on we went, right? Um, but they, they've seen somewhere somebody had shown them something and, and made a big deal out of them using IPv4. Um, uh, that that same user was uh, trying to get their external IP address, and um, they they were connected to VPN. And it, um, when they you know did what is my IP dot com, it came up with uh, the company that I was working with at the time. It came up with their external IP because all their traffic is routed through the VPN and 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 out. And so I had to explain to her, okay, drop off and. Uh, of VPN and do the same exact thing you just did and see it'll be different. And sure enough, it was. And she was all excited because she learned something new that day. So a lot of people don't understand all this. They just really want it to work. And that's the challenge for everybody. So I'm always into, can you prove it out? Can you make sure you truly understand what's going on? And there are times when, when I troubleshoot stuff that sometimes I still can't prove it, and I'll openly admit that. We can't come up with a good answer. But I try to do as many things as I can to get as close to that answer or rule out as many things as possible. So um, it's important to kind of do as much as you can, and that's part of what I'm trying to show is the base knowledge that, that it takes to do those kind of things. Network performance can change minute by minute. Believe it or not, you can be working with an end user and everything is great and um, or, or they've called in and because they're just having a, a real challenging time and nothing connects and so they keep having these drops and the minute you get on everything just looks perfect so if you don't have tools to look back 
and see what's going on, then you're never going to be able to answer that question. Can you prove it? Right. So having things like packet capture, um, packet capture and and analysis of some sort that can an analyze a large, large number of things. Those, those are key things. And um, as you know, I'm kind of a Reveal X fan. So Reveal X is, a, is, is one of those tools that's, that's capable of giving us some of that look back capability. But if you don't have it, it, it really does make it harder to prove out. Now, there's some basic testing that you can do that I'm gonna kind of start to explain here in a little bit that um, if you're able to test while the problem's happening, you might be able to see it and make some good decisions about what's actually happening. And so some of the basic stuff, ping is huge. Um, I use it an awful lot. Telnet, um, not so much. This is more for connection issues, but I still use it to test out connection issues. Tracer, um, this has helped me in multiple places. And if you've watched the previous video, um, I talked about using Tracer to kind of get an idea of where some latency was happening in my environment. So um, again, the basic tools is what I go back to most of the time. So pretty cool stuff, right? Something you want to remember about home connections, though, and, and not just home connections, even corporate connections, they're two way. And this is oftentimes forgotten. Everybody's always talking about, um, well, I've got a, this this. 50 meg connection or this 100 meg connection. What most people don't realize is most of the time these connections are two way. And depending on the provider and who you have as a provider, it could be um, a, kind of an, a, a differing in bandwidth. So if you look at this, in this case, um, I have an upload speed of 10.8 or 10.7 megabits per second. In the download speeds, 38 megabits per second. So not a big deal. And, and several months back, I was actually running um, 12 megabits per second down. Um, actually, let me change that because that's not quite right. Um, I was actually running megabits per second and two megabits per second up. So this was my down. And I, I believe it or not, was able to stream four TVs down with no problem whatsoever. Um, where we would have our problem is this two megabits up. And that would generally cause problems with voice. Um, but two megabits is an awful large amount of data. If you think about it for years, and probably a lot of companies still do, they have 1.5 megabits um, per second for many MPLS connections that I still see today. I mean, that's changing quite a bit, but I still see companies that are running business and running things off of 1.5 megabits per second. Um, a lot of people are moving to, to broadband and other things, and a lot of new small companies are starting up with you know, 50 megabits per second down, but they may only have 10 up. I recently uh, worked with a company that had 40 down and uh, I think it was two up. That's not good. Um, but it, was that enough for them to run their voiceover? Absolutely. And their voice quality wasn't that bad because they weren't a company that does a lot of uploads. So really the only thing that was uploading was the voice. And if you think about it, think about the problems that you might see in this kind of situation. So if you're talking about a voice or a video conversation, you may be able to see everybody and hear everybody fantastic, but the end, you, the other end users complain that they don't hear your voice. To you, it sounds fine. And to you, you see them and hear them well, but other people are complaining that your voice is not that good. So this could become an issue for some. So always remember that connections are two way, it has an effect um, and can cause other challenges along the way. So. We're going to talk a little bit about a home network, right? And this is what um, most home networks are today, is you have your end user and he's sitting here on this IP, this 192.168.1.5, and he could be connected via wireless and the wireless is hardwired in, or it may be a part of the 
the firewall itself. Um, AT and T, several vendors that I know, their their firewall is is has the wireless just tied into it, and, and a lot of people don't do anything else but that. So that's a possibility, or they could just be hardwired directly into their firewall or into a switch that is attached to their firewall, right? And one of the things that I, I hear um, and, and have heard many times and actually had some users talk to me about is the fact that um, one of the first things that people will tell them is, um, oh, you're having voice quality or, oh, you're having performance issues. Oh, you need to not connect to wireless and connect directly to wired. Right. Well, we'll think about that for a little bit. Um, if they're using some sort of AT&T modem uh, slash firewall slash router, um, very good chance that it may only have one connection available to it, right? Um, if they don't own a switch, um, they aren't going to be able to connect anything to it. If they've got a little Linksys router, it might have four ports on it. But um, I just was dealing with a company that they literally had an AT&T wireless um, router that, that connected them to the AT&T network and it did all their wireless and nothing in their environment was wired, right? And so many homes are that way today. Um, so there's very few people that have the wired connections in place. So telling them that right off the bat without even doing any troubleshooting, that to me is dangerous. And um, to me, that that makes you look bad that you immediately go to that. Worst case scenario is, is the wireless is still using B. And if it's still using B, it can drop everything down to 11 megabits per second. So worst case scenario, the only time it'll do that is if there are actually users that are using B on that network, right? That's not not a common thing anymore, um, unless they're using some some older stuff. Uh, even all my iPods that my kids still have and still use, I was able to get them up to G, right? So once I got them up to G and turned off my B, then this never comes into play again, and it won't automatically drop down. So uh, this is pretty uncommon. So most places will have at least G, which is 53 megabits a second, right? Now, depending on the kind of wireless solution they have, that may be shared and split across, you know, the eight or 10 devices, the Amazon um, Echoes and all those kind of things that they have. But 53 megabits per second is still way better than what I, I had at my house just five months ago where I was running 12 megabits per second out. So my bottleneck was really out here at this firewall, and yet I was streaming four TVs, right? Um, and, and still able to VPN in and still able to do work for the most part. Uh, we had a few days where we would tell everybody to get off the network. And my real problem was my, my upload speeds and not my download speeds. So if they've got 53 megabits per second going, they're probably going to be doing pretty good. Um, so it's something that you always want to be concerned about. And I'm always cautious about telling people that, hey, get off wireless and go to something else, right? Um, then you got people going in and buying network cables and, and things like that that I don't think is necessary in many of these cases, right? Um, however, you might be able to figure out that there is a problem because right away, the first thing I would do is ping um, I would ping their gateway, right? So if you ping their gateway, what are you looking for? Well, I'm looking for latency. If there's any latency, then I'd have a concern. But I don't just ping it with a regular ping, right? I would ping, um, let's see, I'd ping with something like this, right? So I would use that ping, I would do a dash L, and I'd ping with like 1480. 
and I want to see what kind of latency they're they're having. So if you're if they're able to ping their gate, gateway with a fully loaded packet, even with a 1500 MTU, you could take it up to 1500 MTU, and they're on wireless. There's a high likelihood that wireless is not the problem, and so immediately I would just not even bring that up anymore. I'd just be done. Um, I might leave a ping running to their gateway just because I want to see if there's times when it does drop by when somebody says echo and the whole thing goes because Amazon starts recording your voice and all of that's dumped up. Always a possibility, right? And and I actually have seen that. My uh, I, I, I have six Amazon devices that I've been playing with and had all of them on the network at once. And, and of course, when um, they all hear people talking and everything else, they start sending that data up. So I had to go around and mute them when I was on the two megabit connection up. So yeah, it's still possible, but is it really because of my wireless? No, it's not because of my wireless. It's because the other 20 devices that I have connected. And the real issue was not the wireless at all. It was really this side of the connection. Okay. And I'm going to spend some time showing you how to do that. That's why be cautious when you're telling people that it's their wireless. That's just a, a dangerous thing, right? Um, so the end user, generally he connects to this firewall, right? And so what he sees is his gateway and his gateway probably is a 192.168.1.1. It's what most default ones are. There's some out there that are .254. Um, you might get something that has something a little bit more different depending on the brand and that sort of thing. But in general, that's what they do is they hit that firewall. That firewall goes out to their home provider, right? And their home provider router might be 74.221.191.1 or whatever the case is, but that's the gateway for your firewall. And I've seen this done multiple ways depending on vendors. Some vendors will do um, like a slash, um, what is it, 30 or 31, so it's three IPs and you literally are on your own network or in some cases I've seen, um, like in this case, maybe this device was like a dot uh, 40, right? Well, I immediately know that this is not on a slash 32 and there's probably other devices that are sitting on this same network. So over at my, you know, the my neighbor's house is probably connecting to that same router and using that as its gateway, right? So then, then at some point that provider, whoever that is, let's, you know, uh, and let's just, I'm going to pick on Pixius, right? Um, you know, because a smaller provider, um, most people have bigger providers like, like Cox and AT&T and, um, you know, Google Fiber and those kind of things. But usually at some point, um, it has to transfer to another provider. So there's a gateway to get to that other provider. So in this case, we're going to go to level three, right? So this network goes to this network. And then let's say your business where you're connecting to is on AT&T. So it goes from level three to AT&T and it connects here. And then it finally connects to the VPN concentrator, firewall or website or whatever you're doing, which that's, then gets added back to whatever the server is back here, right? So that's normally the process. And what many people forget is when you're having problems or drops on the, 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 the from a home provider to here, a lot of people will immediately attribute it to their provider, right? Uh, my connection between between here and here is horrible. Well, not really. This goes back to basic testing, right? So if I'm already doing a ping to my gateway, so I'm pinging, um, you know, the 192.168.1.1, right? And I can see I've got no latency to that. Well, if I know what my gateway is of my router or from, from my router, I can ping that oftentimes, right? Depends on whether the vendor has ICMP turned on. So I can do that and see what the latency is. Or better yet, I can ping something like Google, right? So if I ping Google, which Google's going to sit out here, and so they, this may come across and hit this router, and then it may go straight to Google's router and then goes in this way, right? So at least I can ping that, and now I can see whether there's latency here. I can also do that same ping and ping directly to 
my firewall if it accepts it, right? If ICMP is turned in, on on the VPN firewall. Um, so I can ping that as well. And so it's not on, not all vendors turn it on, it just depends on the vendor. Maybe it's a website, whatever the case is, something on your external network, right? If there's something out there, um, if you're a support desk person, maybe you can ask the firewall guys to turn it on for a little while, just depends. But now you can see what's going on. So normally um, you get that round trip ping coming back from here in, you know, let's say 50 milliseconds. Great. Well, they start complaining and you're watching this continuous ping go on and I'm gonna explain continuous pings here in just a little bit a little bit better. But now you start seeing that that's going up to, let's say 1000 milliseconds, right? Well, is that, is my problem clear out here or is it somewhere else? This is where it's been doing things like a trace hurt, right? So a trace hurt will see, it basically pings this and then gets a ping back, right? It pings each, each router, um, each next hop, all the way through to its destination. So you actually see the ping to here, and actually it'd be like this, and the response back, and the ping to here, and the response back, and then the ping all the way to here, and the response back. Okay. Now, if you're looking at this and you have a thousand milliseconds and this is sitting at 850, but this is, well, this would be 850, let's say 875 and 8, you know, 95. And let's say this is 900. So it's gotten a little better, right? Well, all your latency is really being injected right here. So now I can say that it might be their network, but as soon as I see this, my first suspicion is, is that I've got some Amazon device, right? Or some, some other device on my network that's taken up my bandwidth sending out here. So that's my first suspicion when I see it, the most of the latency injected right here in the very beginning, right? That's the bigger problem. Now, if it was right here, so if, if um, let's clear this and take a look at it from a different perspective, um, if this was only, you know, 10 milliseconds and this to this was 750, this to the return, return back, right? Then now my, my latency is injected here, right? So now I can say, Hey, this is probably somewhere else. And this may be unable for you to get the information to your provider, your provider, your their support desk doesn't generally listen to this stuff. I hate to say it, um, but that's the kind of thing that you can start to tell, hey, it is no longer my network. And really quickly, I would always just ping the gateway. And if you do not see the latency, again, ping with a fully loaded packet, right? I would immediately rule this out, right? If it's fully loaded and it's low latency, I'm done. I, I don't have to worry about it anymore. Um, you know, six milliseconds, five milliseconds, I don't worry about it at all. Th those numbers are, are nothing to me and many switches, many, many wireless, cheap wireless things add a little bit of latency in. So I don't even worry about it at that point. So that becomes, this isn't the problem anymore just because I did that. 90%, I'd say 99% of the time, I'm pretty confident in that, those statistics, right? So then it becomes these next hops. So how am I doing that? Well, what I do is I pay attention to my pings. So I do continuous pings. Um, I always like continuous pings to my gateway. Um, I like continuous pings to, to Google for a little bit. Um, I'm careful. I don't want to take up a bunch of their bandwidth. Don't want to use up their pipe and don't want them to throttle me back because I like the fact that they allow us to do ICMP to them just as a secondary test. I oftentimes will do a fully loaded packet of 1480, 1500 to an outside source that's not my VPN, right? Then I might do a second one. So if I was thinking about it, I would do um, my gateway, then maybe Google and then something inside my VPN um, or um, my VPN concentrator. 
Now this is with the VPN off, right? Because the play is, is what happens is, what do we do with all of our traffic for the VPN? It depends. Um, so I'm gonna go back here for a second and we're gonna erase this. You've gotta be careful because um, if you're VPN in, you've created this tunnel between you and your connection here. You can have what's called split tunneling, which would take you out to Google. So that would mean this guy would hit here and go directly here. Or what may happen, depending on what your company set up, is that connection can go all the way here, hit this box, come back out the proxy, and go out their firewall and hit here, right? So you, you've got to know how your company set up. And the best way to do it is, is what is my IP? And be able to see and then shut off the VPN and do that again and see whether it gives you a different IP, right? Because you're going to what, what is my IP? Um, if it's split tunneling, it would allow it to go this way and it would see a different IP, right? So that's a quick way of doing that test, right? So um, I would definitely do these two things, right? And see what I could do, um, see what the gateway looks like, what Google like, looks like, and uh, maybe my VPN concentrator. One thing to remember is the def, dash F and the ping. That is important because many web um, browsers, matter of fact, all of them, initiate the dash F. They set it so it says do not fragment. And this is a process that's called uh, PMTUD. And I'm not gonna go into detail about this, but this has bit me several times, right? So if you can't get the packet through at 14, 80, then start dropping it down to 1470. Drop all the way down to 1380, right? Really all packets, even over across VPN, should be able to get through at 1380. If they can't get through at 1380, then we have some concerns. And years ago, the Cisco VPN client used to automatically set your MTU to 1380 to keep, um, to just deal with the overhead of the VPN. Uh, but I've actually seen connections and I've seen vendors set their stuff up wrong. Um, and even internally our own stuff where the MTU was, you know, as, as low as, as 300. Um, and so I've had to walk them down that low. It doesn't happen often very much. So I don't do it as often anymore other than to really simulate what the browser might be seeing if we're having browser issues, right? Um, the, if you're having browser issues, I always do the dash F. If you're having other kinds of issues, I don't do it as much because it's not always in play uh, everywhere else. Um, I think I've actually seen recently some SIFS traffic that has the dash F set. So just something to think about, right? And so I, I generally ping the application endpoint, the gateway at their house, the VPN endpoint, and then some other external destination trying to determine it if the latency is the same across all of those, right? Um, if I have high latency at going to their gateway at their house, then yes, there's something on their network that needs to be changed and we need to get that fixed. But most of the time, that's really, really, really rare, right? Um, so then I start looking at the other options, right? And see what, that, what the possibilities are there. So th those are the things that you wanna look at. One of the coolest things is to be able to take a tracer. So if you look on the on the left here, my normal trace route, um, in this case, um, that's not my normal one, but this is from when I had an older IP, but either way, it's, um, you know, my house. Um, that's the gateway that I was using. Okay, so at 192.168.1.1, everybody common gateway. I'm not giving anything away. Uh, my next hop, past my firewall was a 74.221.188.1, right? So that's what the router sitting outside my firewall. Then its next hop was this, and then this, and then it went on to level three for a little bit. This guy just means it wasn't, it's not bad. It just means he's not participating in an ICMP. So he's not gonna respond to an ICMP message. So that's gonna happen. Um, most systems now are doing it, but every now and then you have some that aren't. And then you had your next hop and your next hop and your next hop, right? So my average um, response time is in the 60, 70 milliseconds going to Google, right? That's 
that's about normal. I'm not too worried about it. That that's fantastic. Um, but at a different time, this is what it looked like. So to my gateway was absolutely fine. Five milliseconds. I had nothing to worry about. There's nothing wrong with my network. Um, on wired, it's a little bit better, but not a great deal better. I might get a millisecond, might get two milliseconds out of it on wired. Um, but I also have a pretty solid wireless environment too, right? But now look at that. There's that, that jump going from my house to my router, right? And this is often times where they control the bandwidth that you get, right? So this is where the bandwidth shaping to often takes place, right? As early as possible. Um, so immediately when you see this kind of thing that early, most of the time that says, hey, you're hitting a maximum somewhere. You're hitting a maximum. And then you can see from there on out, every ping to all the rest of the routers was greater than my latency to the one because it has to add that on to it, right? So these others may have been absolutely fine. They may have been, you know, 10 seconds, 10 milliseconds, five milliseconds in between each, right? But this is a high indicator that you've got something on your network or on the network between you and your provider. And that's where it's good to look at, if you can, figure out what your external IP address range is and, and how much of a range is it. Do they have 500, 600, 700 clients on it, right? So it could be somebody else that's bottlenecking that router or th being throttled at that router that's causing the problem, right? It may not be your stuff, but the first place I look is always my stuff, right? Um, what I have control over. And if it's nothing on my network, then I'm pretty confident that somebody in that environment. So you may have 500 clients that are now working from home and they're all busy and somebody's just pulling down all the bandwidth on your um, provider's network, right? And that, that might be worth a call to the provider. But if it um, if that number was was different, right? If this was, you know, what it was, and this was um, 10, and this was 40, you know, and this was 40, and this was 800, now it's further on out from my provider, right? And so most likely there's not a, a lot that I can do with it, and hopefully they're paying attention to that, and that'll clear up because level three will move something to a new route. And it might be fun if it does clear up to do another trace route and see, does this change, right? Um, oftentimes I do see that, hey, I was 800 milliseconds to that router and boom, it got better. And this router is out of the picture, right? Different one. So just something to think about. Pretty cool stuff, right? So next one, um, latency can be related to bandwidth. Um, I think I showed this the other day in, in some of my... Uh, earlier videos. This was my wife uh, uploading some videos that were, were um, uh, she'd actually made a mistake and uploaded videos or um, put four videos in the same folder that's that's um, designed to sync for backup, right? And it backs up to the cloud. And those four videos were just, um, it was uploading all of them. They're four gigabytes each. Um, and so all of them we're starting to upload and I only have a, a 12 megabit up or, or less, right? Um, depending on the time of day and whatever else is going on. So you can see that this starts happening. And if you look, you can see every time we had a, an upload, right? We started having high latency. And then as she got to this bigger one, we have a bigger one right here, right? And so that, that really impacted my family significantly. We could see it and I was researching the problem. And if we go back, this is where I saw this, right? And so immediately I started looking in my house to see what it was. So I've got um, some pretty good tracing tools and I could see the devices that was taking up the most of it. And so I found it was my wife's computer. And so I went over and got on the client. And the first thing I did was just throttle it. And you can see because of this flat line here, it's still pushing data, but that's because it's throttled, right? And so when that pushed, 
when um, we finished up some things because we had a bunch of Zoom meetings we had to do that night. You can see the little Zoom meetings going on right here and here. Um, when those Zoom meetings came back, she was those files were still uploaded, and she said, hey, can you fix this? And so I, I removed the three that didn't need to be there because they were exact copies, removed those and put them in a different folder, and then um, released the bandwidth, and you can see, boop, it just took off, finished the upload, and it was done, right? And you can see this whole time, latency stayed fine, bandwidth was fine. So pretty cool. Um, and, and it definitely impacted everything. I, I mean, we were having slow applications. We were having all kinds, almost all the complaints that I listed at the very beginning. We had every one of those when that was taking place. But again, we could tell because of what we were seeing right here, right? I could see that really quick. And so that was important for me to spend some time with and, and, and show you guys some of this, right? And I know it wasn't my, um, my, wireless because pinging my gateway was you know five milliseconds i've got a gigabit network inside my house so it was always five sec milliseconds or less and most of my wireless is set um, to do high speed so i can get 758 megabits per second out of my wireless often um, usually your wireless is not your bottleneck anymore today so cool stuff so um, the last thing is this vpn latency piece and this is this is goes back to monitoring your VPN and all your VPN clients, right? And so when we're monitoring Reveal X, um, I, I'm paying attention to this, and there's four different profiles that we have for our users. That um, uh, actually two, I'm sorry, because one's the 95th and one's the medium, right? So there's there's really um, two profiles on a VPN, on, on this VPN. You might have 20 different profiles, depending on the users and where you want them to go. But each one of those profiles ends up being on a different uh, VLAN per se, or a different subnet mask, right? And so, um, you know, these two are the same, and then these two are the same, right? And so you, we keep an eye on these, but they're on the same exact concentrator. And what was interesting to note is all of a sudden we see this big spike, right? So right here, we start taking a look. But what's interesting is we have all of these guys that are staying low. So immediately, I, I mean, when this starts to happen and we started getting a few complaints, the first thing was, is, is our VPN concentrator having problems? Well, no, all of our users, um, which is the majority of users, believe it or not, we're running along with low latency, not an issue. So there's no way for it to be the VPN concentrator. That immediately tells me our systems are running good. I'm not gonna be as concerned about this specific issue, but because we're receiving complaints, still needs to be investigated, but I'm not affecting the majority of users, just a small percentage. So is it possible that the this these other profiles out here, um, is it possible that they had some sort of throttling on it. Well, it, it's worth checking into, um, but that wasn't the case, right? And you could see that the median, because the median is the blue, and you can see it down here, the median, the average is way down here. So that immediately tells me that the majority of admin users are okay. So now I'm, I'm even less concerned, right? So now the likelihood, as I start investigating, this whole thing is brought on by just a couple of users having high latency, okay? Because remember, this is measuring from what they connect to in, in this environment all the way back out to them. So it's getting the, it, it, even though it's tapped in our network and not, we don't have a tap at their house, we still can tell that there's high latency between us and them because there's certain things that when you send data down to them, you expect an acknowledgement back really quick. So you can tell when that data passed and when that data got to them roughly and how soon they sent the ag back. Now that, that acknowledgement back could be because of a CPU issue on their box, right? But this gives us a lot of information about um, their environment. And it gives me a lot of information to say, this isn't our equipment, right? This is not our 
um, network. This is not uh, anything else I need to be concerned with. This isn't affecting the masses so quickly. Um, when we get one or two calls, I can look in here and go, this is not affecting the masses. This is a one or two person issue. We can work with those people to get it fixed, but I don't need to be um, calling in all my resources because we've got a much larger issue, right? So the ability to see this um, within a tool that like Reveal X, um, that, that monitors this for you and provides statistics is fantastic if you know how to read those statistics and you trust the data. In this case, I trusted the data, did some tests. Again, same type of thing as we started testing the end user, um, similar type behavior was happening, right? So worked perfect, um, did great for me, was fantastic way of doing things. So um, hopefully this helps somebody out. Uh, it, it works quite well. Oh, I did want to spend a few minutes and show you um, one other thing, right? So we're going to do this.